fishing destination on Earth. It's a place that challenges the senses, lifts the spirit, expands the imagination. No words can truly describe Alaska. It simply must be experienced. For former National Hockey League star, Gee Bear, an invitation to share an Alaskan fishing experience with me in the heart of the state's most prolific fishing waters near Lake Iliamna in the southwest portion of Alaska was an offer he couldn't refuse. Tom Robinson's Rainbow King Lodge sits on the shores of the lake and within short flying distance of some of the finest trophy salmon and trout fishing waters found in the world. Once airborne, the size and scope of Alaska unfolds in distinct ways. Roads are nowhere to be seen, and the land seems to unfold in endless, uncluttered vistas, leaving the mind open for imagination. Years ago, Tom Robinson fell in love with Alaska, and he now shares his plan for this place with anyone that comes his way. Tom's plan for the day was to deliver Gee Bear and I to a river for a day of trout fishing that would not soon be forgotten. This is the famous Moraine Creek in Katmai National Park. Uh, very famous for large, very large rainbows. Rainbow. Very famous for very large bears, too. We, yeah, we've seen them. So I, I know those are here, but I don't know about the fish yet. We had one just fishing with us just across the way there. So how do you fish these fish? You, you use well, really, egg patterns, Yeah, huh? just about everybody here now uses uh, egg patterns. Obviously, the sockeye come in here. They're digging their nests. They're laying their eggs. The rainbows for centuries have followed them up here. Yep. And, you know, it's a it's, uh, main part of the rainbow's diet. I mean, they put on several pounds in the next month feeding off the sockeye, not only the eggs, but the carcasses and the flesh as they deteriorate. So this is the ticket right here. These are the, a lot of different colors, huh? He, you know, eggs take on different colors at different stages in their development, particularly if they're not fertilized. The ones that are not fertilized change color to get very light. All right, I got, I got one more thing I got to ask here, because I watched Gee play hockey for years and years. <laughs> you were born in New York, right? Yeah. Grew up in New York. Not really French. <laughs> not, not born in France and not born in Quebec. Correct. So why isn't, why don't you call yourself Guy Herbert? It can't be Herbert because there's no R before the B. Ah. So, so. Uh, I've been called Guy Hebert. Guy Bear, Bobby, uh, I've been called so, some other things, other things as well. But uh, literally, my name was picked by my dad out of uh, my dad's been a hockey player and a hockey fan his whole life, and um, for Guy Lafleur. Ah, oh. how in the world did you? Nobody wanted to be a goalie. That's sort of like playing right field, isn't it? <laughs> well, you would think. Uh, you know, I grew up at an older brother who was starting to play hockey, and um, you know, younger brothers always want to tag along. And kind of my job to be able to tag along was that I had to help him start to develop. We had a little makeshift net, and my dad would pull out some oversized gloves and a stick and give them to me and make me stand in that net. And my brother would take shots on me with tennis balls. And I mean, there's a, there's a story that still haunts my mom of me coming upstairs crying. And as she looked at me, she, you know, she almost had a heart attack. She looked at me, and I had, I had tennis ball welts all over my body, and I was three years old. So, uh, <laughs> but my dad told me I was supposed to like that feeling that I was doing my job, and um, you know, I, I, I believed him at that point, and oh, I guess me? I believed him ever since. Yeah, well, look, turned out all right, didn't it? Yeah, yeah, it turned out all right. It's worked out quite well for Gee Bear. During the time he spent with the Anaheim Mighty Ducks, he set their all-time record for the most wins, the most shutouts, and the lowest goals against average. And he was part of the 1998 U.S. Olympic team. His interest in fly fishing began during long bus rides he had while playing in the International Hockey League. A journey to Alaska fulfills a lifelong dream. You want to cast up into the ripple and let it drift right down into that deeper water. Yeah, I guess we're, see, we're getting out to the sockeyes. You can see the sockeyes there? Yeah. So they're probably hanging around those. Oh, yeah. Oh, Look at yeah. That. Big guy. Tail water. 
Walker. Tail Walker. Here we go. Can fight pretty good. Grayling. Is it? Yeah. That's a pretty good sized grayling. We, we get some action. There are some big grayling in here. Kind of nice little change of pace. Oh, I mean, that's a very, very big grayling. Look at that thing. It flies out. Good sized grayling. Not bad for a fight. Fish on, fish on. Good fish, good fish. Uh oh, he get off. He gave him slack. Get up on him, he's still on. on. Now, I guess we'll see if you can get one all the way to the net this time. Yeah, I know. <laughs> no pressure now. I spent my life guarding the net. I just, it must be. <laughs> so that's the, whole, that's the whole theory. It gets close to the net, you don't want it in it. A little backwards. The fish in the net is a good thing here, Keith. Hurry up, run out there, fast. <laughs> you can't even see that fish in the water, they're so bright. Just a little silver bullet. <laughs> What's this theory? Just back him up? Yeah. <laughs> Too reeling. Oh yeah, beautiful fish. Now how long would it take before this fish Puts on, let's say, half a pound. Uh, you know, within the next two weeks, it will. Because of the eggs. Let's put them out here, huh? That was All right, nice one. He broke the yeah, ice. I broke the ice. He actually we got that a, him in. Is that a bad term from a hockey player to break the ice? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think so. But in this case, it's, it's a good one. It's a good one. Yeah. <laughs> when fly fishing the world returns, the brown bears search for salmon and he and I witnessed the essence of an Alaskan fishing experience firsthand. What do you think, John? <laughs> Katmai National Park in southwest Alaska is an outdoor adventure's utopia. Hikers, nature photographers, and fly anglers make their way to this remarkable region that is only accessible by air. What they find when they arrive is a spectacle that'll boggle the mind. Katmai is the very essence of wild Alaska and the fishing inside the park rarely disappoints. Guy Bear and I continued to search the waters of Moraine Creek for rainbows. Tom Robinson kept watch for bears. Well, I can't believe how hard a fish that size pulls. This guy is not know that? big either, huh? Did you hook a fish? I don't know, I think he hooked me. This is a tester one. Oh, big fish on down there. This fish wants to bring me back to uh, the lodge right now. It's going so far. I was into the backing in about five seconds. Oh, there's my fish. He's got a big fish down there. Well, wait till you see this fish, John. I'd love to see him. Oh, that's a pretty big fish. He's yeah, bigger he than I thought, too. No, he is a good size yeah, fish. Yeah, big fish. That is a huge fish. Whoa. Look at that. It's huge. That's a gigantic it's fish. It's huge. That, that 30 is inches. <laughs> oh, my God. Look at that fish. <laughs> you get a gee? I'm getting my exercise running up and down the stream. Look at that red strand. Look at that. That's that is, the, that's probably, I, I get you, that is a 30 inch fish. I think it's real close to it. It's yeah. right at 30, I'll bet you. You know what, I'm I gotta, <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, let's put them against the. Put them on here. And we'll check them later. He's right the back there. Ooh, there he goes. He's all right. John, I'm coming back to Alaska. <laughs> the native waters for rainbow trout are the eastern Pacific and the freshwater streams west of the Rocky Mountains. Their acrobatic displays and fighting abilities have made the rainbow a favorite fish for anglers throughout the world. Today, rainbows are found from England to New Zealand, Argentina to America. But without a doubt, the richest rainbow trout fishery in the world sits inside of Alaska. Indicator was going way upstream. 
Whoa. You guys keep doing this to me, double. <laughs> That's a hot fish there. Yeah, I don't know if I can get him on my... He's coming up stream like mad. Look at that. Watch your line. Oh. Am I under you, Geese? Yeah. Geese, hold your rod up, straight up, yeah. Look at this fish. <laughs> Ripping line upstream. It's like a Chinook, man. This is like an Alaska waltz. That was unbelievable, the way that fish hit. Oh. Look at that thing. God, it's This is a beauty. Oh, this yeah, look at that. Nice. Fish, huh? You know, Tom, I was thinking since you have that net out. Can we get two? Can we get two in the net? Just remember, mine's the bigger one. I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> How's that? Like that. That's, that's fish in Alaska ah. style. <laughs> Yours Which is, is the bigger one. His is the bigger one. Yeah, I think it is. <laughs> That's about uh, 11 pounds of fish right there. That's pretty cool. That's the first, Look I'd have that. to say. Oh, uh, that's my first. In the net. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that is a gorgeous picture. Look at that. Is this your average? I, I, I wish I had my drill right? cam. Well, somebody always told me, never leave fish to find fish. And I'm not going to leave fish to eat lunch <laughs> either. When Fly Fishing the World returns, Gee Bear hooks the largest oh, rainbow man. trout of his life. Alaskan brown bears that prowl the banks of Moraine Creek in southwest Alaska peacefully share the stream with respectful anglers. But make no mistake, these are wild animals and can be dangerous. When the salmon begin their runs in the summer, brown bears find their way to Alaska's rivers to gorge themselves. In just a few short weeks, they can gain 20% of their body weight. The young bears are easy to spot with their boundless energy. Older bears employ a more patient strategy of quietly walking the banks until opportunity presents itself. Most of the time, anglers are safe around the bears who are much more interested in the salmon. The exception comes when a mother bear with cubs feels threatened. He and I kept an eye out for bears, but the lure of Moraine Creek's rainbows kept us knee deep in the stream, even with the bears in sight. Oh, oh, yeah, there's a good fish there. That's a good one there. Oh. Yeah. Oh, now we're talking. Whoa. Oh, oh, oh. Oh. That one's ripping yeah. you. There's a difference Listen. there, isn't there? <laughs> Did you see that? Did you see how much line that one took? Almost lost a finger. Oh, oh, oh. it's like a bonefish, man. Look at this. <laughs> I that almost lost your, a damn finger. I had a finger there. There. <laughs> Wow. That fish ripped. <laughs> yeah, I'd say okay. so. We got a double. Yes! Oh, that's a good fish. Oh, he's slacking it. Oh. <laughs> that, that wasn't the hook on that one. I'm we going to down. go downstream, man. I'm going down. I am going down. <laughs> he had a good fish, too. Now we're looking at the old Moraine. Yeah. Big now guy. There we are. Oh, that's a beauty. Yeah, it is. It's just a thick thick fish with a little attitude, you know? <laughs> oh, you know what? He ran out 75 yards just in about the first 45 seconds. Oh my God, look at that. Oh. Look yeah! At, look at the spots. Look at the oh, colors on that fish. God. Isn't that a beauty? Now, this fish will add probably three or four pounds here. I mean, he'll, he'll have a belly coming out like this in a couple of days. Not a couple of days, a couple of weeks. From eating the sockeye eggs. From eating the eggs. And you know what? I think that fly is out. Yeah, fly is out. <laughs> How does that look, my friend? Yeah, that, that guy's going to put on four or five pounds. That is just Look at the pounders. width of the tail. Perfect condition. That, and it's got that white, the white uh, white on the tips. On the tips yeah. you see the Must right be side. right on the bottom of it. Oh man, fish of a lifetime. Somebody else got a fish on. Excuse me, pardon me. Excuse me. Sorry, sorry, sorry. No. 
Oh, yeah, that's a good one. Hold tight then. I'll see if I can get below here. Look at that one. How was that, huh? How was that one? This one's fat. This one's been eating a little bit. Another female. And look at that rainbow. Huh? <laughs> they just keep getting better and better. Okay, I think we can turn this guy around. You just want to stay here with me, don't you? Look at the size of that thing in there. Like, I'm going to go to sleep tonight, and I'm going to wake up tomorrow and think this is all a dream. <laughs> this is all a dream. Yeah. you got a little bit of time left. you better get back. Yeah, I'm going to sprint back up to that spot. When fly fishing the world returns, it's silver salmon on a fly in the world-famous Upper Tulerick Creek in southwest Alaska. Fishing the world is brought to you by... The next F-150, built Ford Tough. By Sage, the world's leading producers of premium fly rods. By Hide Drift Boats, the leader in design, value, and service. And by Sims, manufacturers of quality waders, vests, and outerwear for the serious sportsman. Fly Fishing the World uses equipment provided by these fine companies, including Fish Pond, the future of fly fishing. What do anglers who've become saturated with catching oversized rainbow trout do in Alaska? Tom Robinson is in charge. They stop by a private section of water on the famous Upper Tulerick Creek for a chance at catching a few silver salmon. It was early in the season, but Tom had a hunch the silvers might have moved into the Upper Tulerick. Gee Bear moved into position to make a cast. Oh, oh yeah. my God! <laughs> <laughs> Holy smokes! I couldn't even pretend to think that we would f catch fish like this. I mean, these are unbelievable. Like this yeah. fish, he doesn't. I'm getting tired, and he's not. <laughs> Looks like he might be slowing up a little bit, oh, but I'm almost afraid to just say a that. Little. Yeah, well, it's right when you think he's slowing up, he'll get in here and just say, "Okay, it's a, it's a silver, it's a big dark silver." Yeah. <laughs> It's a good thing I have a lot of help here landing this fish. I don't know what that is, but that's, that's a 15. Huge. Oh my god, look at that. That's a 15 pound fish, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> look at that thing. Here, big old buck, huh? Let me grab your rod. Why don't you grab, just take your hand and slide him down the tail here. And there's a bone right in the tail. You can grab. There you go. Pick it up. <laughs> this is why I came to Alaska right here. <laughs> that is unbelievable. <laughs> Any angler who's ever picked up a fly rod has heard the hype. Visions of enormous fish in countless numbers found in a setting that is bigger and bolder than any other fishing destination on Earth. Now toss in a float plane, add a few brown bears, mix it with a rainbow trout and silver salmon, and you have the quintessential Alaska fishing experience. There you go. That's perfect. And if you ask E. Bear, you will be changed forever. Might be the most important show for the mom and pop operations. This is their one chance to get in front of a big retail. Yes, Jason's property is a long ways from the Western trout fishing waters. Three time Tour de France winner Greg LeMond spends most of his fly fishing time. An afterlife that was put on the world stage during his run to the top of the cycling world. Greg Lamont now finds peace and quiet in the simple rhythms of fly fishing. An opportunity to go after some of the largest brown trout of his life was enough to tempt him to join me down under in 
Australia. Under the guidance of Brian McCullough, Greg and I began on the shores of Big Jim Lake. Look at how beautiful this is. Yeah. The black swans. Oh, yeah. Now, do they bother the fish at all? No. No, I don't worry. Fish will swim all. right around them. Yeah, yeah. I've seen, I've seen fish tailing in around them, and they don't really worry them too much. No. no. Now, have you ever stood on the edge of a lake like this? Watch no. it wake up. With all these, not not a trout lake. With all this, uh, all these birds. I know. It is. It feels like we're in, like, the Amazon. Like, yeah, it's, it's Costa Rica in the well, jungle. Have you been this yeah. cold in Costa Rica in the jungle? No. <laughs> What's going to be on this morning here is, uh, we'll wade out about just short of these logs here, and we're best to get out on the other side of the weed, and when we when we hook a fish, we can take it away from us, right. okay? So we get out on the outside of the weed, move along. I'd suggest the retrieve be fairly slow because it's very, very calm, and uh, we'll be using small flies. So as we're working up, make sure you pay particular attention to the inside you know, right. up against the weeds. Still work the arc, but we'll be working in close to the weed because that's where we've been so catching. So casting it. two in the shore? Yeah, yeah, we'll be casting long ways and out, yes. Okay. Ooh, did you see that? Yeah, there's another one on the other side. Yeah? There. Yep. See, those those fish would be very hard to target with a dry. Yeah, Because, they as you can see, in, it, there's not a lot in the air. Right. Uh, as far as dry fly is concerned. Uh, dead calm, right? Dead, dead calm, yep. It's an Australian movie, Dead Calm. Dead Calm, dude. Yeah, hopefully it's not the, the same end result. Do you see this this mist over here? Yeah. Doesn't it almost look like some of the, the steam in Yellowstone? Oil yeah, comes that's off? exactly. It looks like you're in the, the going towards Old Faithful. Yeah. Gee, black swans. Up. I'm going to go fish, guys. I yeah, go okay. Away. We're going to go down here and start to work up. That fish just moved again on the other side of the logs there, uh, John. Oh, oh, way over there? Yep. take a bird's eye view of this water and look down. I mean, are fish solo or do they go in no, groups? No, mainly solo, yeah. But in this lake, with the, which has just got all browns in it, they're mainly solo. Just in round the week, nice and close there. That's it. Oh. Fish on. You notice where he picked that fish up? In close. Burned, yeah. Look at this thing rip from line off. Yeah, these, these fish average about four pounds, you know, three and a half pound mate. So there's some nice fish on this. I don't mind getting my hands wet in this water for this fish. Oh. Man, what a fish. You see that thing, Greg? Fish you see this, Greg? Yeah. Wow. There he goes. That's a good way to start the morning, huh? The fishing in magical and mysterious Tasmania had gotten off to a good start. But fly fishing the world returns. It's Greg Lamont's turn to find the fish down under. I see him. You see the fish? Yep. Most of the fishing is done in lakes, and guides and anglers keep a constant eye out for cruising fish along the shallow shorelines. It's one part hunting and one part fishing. It also requires a keen eye and the skills to hook a brown trout that easily could be over five pounds. One of our problems here, they're going to be working upwind the whole time. Here he is, just keep the rod tip there. Look at him. Now you see there's a bush there behind you. I see him. You see the fish? Yep. Oh, he was. Yeah, 
Yeah, he's into those leaf hoppers. That's good. That's excellent. Got that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Got that. Wow. Let him run. Trouble getting through that knot at the top, eh? Yeah. <laughs> they always keep a bit in reserve. <laughs> Rainbows will bulge straight open. Look at these fellas. <laughs> Let's see if I can. Okay. okay. I think, I think you're almost to the end. Yep. Okay. Now, that'd be better with my right hand. Wow. We got some nice, uh, beautiful, nice. beautiful teeth. Ah, that's. I haven't had a brown with that well-developed teeth in a long time. Huh? Ooh. Like that. Thank you. Well done, partner. Well done. That was great. Well done. Now, how did he cut me to be? No, just let him, yeah, just let him, you'll feel him just start to ease when he wants to go, okay? He's fine. Oh, yeah. Well that done. was nice. One cast, one fish. That was like uh, stream, uh, spring creek fishing. Yeah, yeah. Just it, drop it right on it. Yeah, it was a good cast. Good cast. I yeah. like that. And he didn't hesitate, did he? And yeah, straight over the top. Well done. Whew. A good day of fishing and a great meal led to a true Tassie bush experience. London Lakes is home to a variety of animals that look like they were designed by Dr. Seuss. Many of these natives are nocturnal, so an evening driving safari was the best way to find them. What we'll see tonight, hopefully, are various types of wallabies, uh, perhaps a potteroo, perhaps a bandicoot, perhaps a barred bandicoot, perhaps a, a, a white possum, black possum. This is better than Africa. Oh, much better. Man. Much better. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I just can't figure out why this is called heaven. There's a lot of devils here. There's many devils. Well, <laughs> heaven with devils. Greg and Kathy Lamont joined Jason Garrett and I, and Joseph Holmes, a Tasmanian naturalist, guided us into the bush. There's a wombat. The thing about wildlife is you can always get a kick out of wildlife. You see something different each time. You see it doing something differently in a different environment, interacting with other animals differently. Um, that's the thrill for me. It never gets boring. It never gets stagnant. There's a quail. They're a marsupial. Not, not a feral cat. No, not a feral cat. Okay. They're a marsupial. And the ones we see tonight will be these little black and white ones, and you'll see some sandy colored ones and white ones. I really appreciate being in the wilds of, of Tasmania because you're very close and you're very, you get the sense that those animals haven't seen too many people and they haven't been interacted with much by humans. You see the black mark on his chest there? It's a scent gland there that they mark their territories with. They're highly territorial, these animals. That there looks to be a smaller female possum. I suppose I was uh, interested in animals from a very young age. Um, I grew up in a small country village and uh, in a small valley where I was surrounded by wildlife the whole time. And uh, I used to immerse myself in the wildlife around me and became very familiar with it and enjoyed being around it. There is something, hold it there. That's an echidna. I believe it. That's an echidna. Now, I, I'll tell you an interesting thing about these. Uh, that they're an anteater. Uh -huh. I witnessed once a log running into the water. And one of these echidnas was tapping the log down the length of the log. And then it went down to the end of the log and got the ants as they came out of the <laughs> log. Right? It's beautiful, you know. Only two egg-laying marsupials. In Australia. Platypus and, and, and this. Does it hurt? Yeah. Yeah, the sharp spine. 
Here he is, right in front of the tree here. The fly fishing the world and returns. Our search for a 30-inch brown trout in Tasmania to continues. Located in the geographical center of Australia's island state, the expansive property that makes up London Lakes is truly Tassie bush country. Few roads traverse the property, and no other anglers were anywhere to be found. Brian McCullough led Greg Lamont and me through the bush and to the edge of a promising looking bank on Lake Samuel. Oh, he's found a hole. I see a lot of flies out. On the water. Yeah, there's a lot of food on the water, isn't there? Was that a fish above you? Yeah. I heard something. Could be that red fish there. above you there somewhere. The red fin work up there. <laughs> oh, there's one. There he is. That's not a red fin. What are you doing? What do I have there? Now, what do you have here? Good car. Got it? Fish on. Oh, nice fish, too. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, oh, oh Jesus. Oh, oh, no. I oh. lost it. I think we might have popped him. That was a monster. He's a good popped fish. Him, I think. Oh, God. <laughs> that was so nice. <laughs> that was, uh... I got the feeling you might want another pair. I lost the fly on that guy. I think you might have left a fly in him. I did. Wow. You see him, Brian? Oh, yeah. Here he is, right in front of the tree here. And he's heading back down towards you, Greg. Just not far out. You only need to be... That's too far. Pull it. That'll do you. Come down a bit further. Just leave that right where it is. Just leave it. Me? Yeah, you. Yeah. Just ticker it in towards you. Um, no, leave it. Ticker it in a little bit. Look, leave it. Look, that'll look. Perfect. Just in a little bit, not much. In, in. We're right on line there. Just leave it. Just leave it. Fish, just pull it in another half foot. Good. <laughs> oh man, that was well done. <laughs> that was great. I would say that is team fishing, wouldn't you? That was awesome. Oh look at this, the guys are right here. You got him? There's a lot of twigs here, we don't want to... Come on fella. Oh, that is a beautiful fish. Look at that thing. You see that? That, Greg, is a brown trout in Tasmania. Yeah. Well, that was a, that was a beautiful little set of team fishing. <laughs> okay. That's a nice looking fish. Isn't that? Beautiful fish, yeah. Well, that's a long fish. Yeah, it's a fairly long that's fish. That's a very long fish. I'll bet you that fish, I don't have my tape measure on me. I'll bet it's you that's a 24 or five yeah, inch fish. Yeah, it certainly would be. What'd you no, catch him on, John? I've got him. I caught him, Greg, on this little Dave... <laughs> Dave Hopper. Dave he run a hawk hopper. I could see the fish uh, probably the last, oh, I'd say six feet when he was coming towards the fly. All right. And when you were... I knew he was going to take it. <laughs> That's great. Here's another one coming down. I saw him. Did you? That's a team. That was very good team. That was good work. Today. That's a that's One team here, Tasmania. Two, One foot here, two foot there. Yeah. Team Tasmania and Team USA. Yeah. Combined to catch one. What? Lock Lake Brown Trout, right? Finally, the fish begin to rise. And when we return, the pursuit for an oversized brown trout on the lakes of Tasmania 
As Greg Lamond and I waded the waters of Lake Samuel Judge in Judge Tasmania, Judge Jason Garrett, Judge the owner Judge of Judge London Judge Lakes Judge Lodge, showed up to provide his help. His intimate knowledge of the waters helped put me in the right position to make a cast. There's a fish right in front of the, off the end of this log. We need to be up here. See him working see him. towards me? See him. Moving away. Yeah, I wouldn't chase him because he, he, there's definitely more than one fish here. So move it well up to the left of him. So, well done. Perfect. Just give him another go when, he, uh, when you see him. There you are, that's right on his nose again. Yeah, good fish. Well done, John. Well... Nice piece of fishing. I'll tell you, Jason, we're a good team. I think he's got himself wrapped around a little weed out here, Jason. I hate to do this, but I'm gonna have to. What's that? Walk out a little bit. Well, he dove right into this weed and wrapped himself around it, Jason. Right. I could, um... Well, this is all I can do here. Let me try this. I'd give him slack if I did anything. Ah, he's got off. Shoot. Good fish, though, Jason. Ah, lovely fish. Five-pound fish. Five or six-pound fish. Good yeah. brown. You know, there's a there's one stick right there and one weed, and he went over the stick and around the weed, and I could feel him. There's nothing I could do. Nothing I could do. You know, if you caught every fish, Jason, you wouldn't go fishing. You wouldn't go fishing. The most memorable fish aren't always the ones that come to hand. At times, it's the ones that get away. And in a location as exotic and memorable as Tasmania, the entire fishing experience seems so different. I can't wait to return. Now, we got a new guy today. Ed's not going to fish, I know that, but he's yeah. going to give us the right flies. I'm going to give you the right flies. What do you got for flies? What do you well, think? we got some flies we find very good. This is a favorite here called a wood special. Char fly. Char and trout. And another favorite here is the, the green muddler. Ah, oh, now that's pretty. Uh, that's what you ought to, one of them you ought to start with. Liz, can I sling the green one? Yeah. yeah. Sling the green one. Green hornet right here. And of course, when things are really popping, a mouse pattern. The little mouse, which kind of imitates the lemming yeah, here, uh, look at that thing. is fun to watch brook trout chase it. And if we go to a dry sometime or today, favorite is the. Uh, is the royal wolf. That's a nice big royal wolf yeah. pattern. Other flies that work good is the Mickey fin and uh, you know variations. These fish aren't too particular. I got the mean green machine going. There he is. There he is right there. Hit the flounder. Beautiful male. It's a long way to come to catch a fish but these fish are so beautiful. Perfectly colored, as you can imagine. Glasses well, got one on. Get there, you little tuna. Later days, Willie Mays.
See that? <laughs> you, you didn't touch him, did you? He's probably come back again. That was subtle. A oh, beautiful little male. Took a dry fly. Look at the size of that dry fly. That's about as big a dry fly as I've ever caught a fish on right there. Les, you ought to come try this. Dry flies. Yeah? Dead drifting. All right? Come on down where I am. Holy mackerel, look at that dog. <laughs> Is that the biggest dry fly you've ever seen? It's the biggest dry fly I've ever hooked. What the hell is that thing you got? It's a Goddard caddis. Tied by a guy in England named John Goddard. But I don't think he ever had visions of it being this big. Just I'm into the cutting edge aspect of it. I'm, I'm not I'm, sure if you I'm, need the antennas quite that big. Oh, leave them on there. It's like a 64 Impala with curb feelers. <laughs> Things ready to go. You'll either get them to explode on it, or they'll be laughing at me hysterically. Got it. Do the old Impala, man. <laughs> Catch and release, catch and release. The thing about it is you can skate it, you can mend it, you can do whatever, because I think a little movement doesn't hurt it. Got it. Ooh, you were slow. too slow. A little slow on the draw. You're getting into the zone right in here. All right. Yep, see him poke at it? Yeah, yeah. I'll be damned. That's fun fishing. Yeah, I like that. Isn't that? You can throw a one-inch dry fly and they'll come up and hit it. <laughs> it's a little bit bigger fish, too. It's like hucking a loaf of bread at him. <laughs> it's about like tossing a loaf of bread, <laughs> too. <laughs> can you imagine the feeling that this guy has when this doesn't turn out to be a meal? This is a good fish. I think of them as little fishy astronauts coming out of their atmosphere into ours. <laughs> that is a good fish. Is it a male or female? Huh? Female. Trout, rainbow. Bye bye. We we're always on the hunt for the elusive golden trout. We're still on that hunt. Still pipsqueak. See, in California, this would be a big fish. And actually, the way I became friends with Fred is I used to work at this delicatessen, this mall delicatessen, and. Uh, he came in one time with some friends of mine and got a sandwich and he went to pay me and I was like, it's cool, dude. From then, from that point on, we are, we are pals. Nick, Nick, Nick. You just, you know, you just gotta feed him. I, I bought his friendship with a beef log sandwich. You're not gonna whomp me in the head, are you? <laughs> Hopefully not. <laughs> As Les and I grew up, going through high school and all. Don't go out any farther, Cork. We worked at the gas station, he was playing in bands. It was um, pretty apparent to me, especially, and probably the people, especially in his music class, that Les was definitely something pretty special. Thanks, bud. He started playing that bass and, and really getting popular. See, look, he's sperming all over the place. The other one was egging. Go sperm on somebody else, pal. He was always Joe Cool. He had the Pompadour. He had the 68 Cougar. Look at my hackle, look at this thing. That's what they're eating? You gotta be kidding me. It was pretty slick. We'd go around and we'd hang out and stuff. Come here. Kitty, 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 kitty. As um, we got out of high school, he started you know, playing more bands and getting a little more serious, doing his own thing. And um, as time went by, he, he became famous. They're camera shy. They're more camera shy than they are line shy. As well they should be. It's a horrible thing, this show business. It's steal you, steal your soul. Les, as he's become famous, he's definitely a loyal guy. He's very humble. Woohoo! Bad fella cracker. He treats everybody like they're his good friend. The kids that come up to him and ask him for autographs and stuff, he'll stop whatever he's doing. He'll sign whatever they have, he'll talk to them. If there's somebody interested in learning a bass or anything about a bass, he's willing to just, you know, hang out with them, talk to them, tell them what it's about, and tell them what to expect. Oh, there we 
to go. I was just coming in to help you out, Les, but it doesn't look like you need it. Well, I was hurting there for a minute. Just heading out to sea. Female. How can you tell? If they don't have the big orange stripe on the belly, they're less colorful, it's a female. The males are far more beautiful. Hello, girly. You know, I'd, I'd get into trouble if I said that's like everything else in life, but yeah, it's a female. Fly, be free. Les is the most well-known rock and roll fisherman. <laughs> abundance of wildlife. It's composed of many uh, caribou and we do have other animals such as bears, polar bears, all the way down to fox, red fox, white fox, martens and uh, we do also have uh, a population of muskox and this is on top of the different kind of fish that we get uh, along the rivers and along the lakes. Well, I tell you, I came up uh, about 12 years ago, and I was intrigued with the availability of uh, Arctic char, just a, a great fish. The char seems like something that's burned, <laughs> charred. I have no idea. <laughs> the uh, line you use on a fly fishing rod. A char is related to a trout, but it is not the same. A brook trout is a char, but a brown trout is a trout and also the remoteness of the area. I think that's one of the things that I really enjoy is the fact that uh, you don't see anybody else. We have it all to ourselves up here. I like the tundra, actually. I like the feel of the tundra as you're walking on it because it has this squishiness that you wouldn't expect. As far as fishing, yesterday was, was, was tough with the wind smacking us in the face. How the hell were you able to cast that bank? How? Yeah, Jesus. That was insane. <laughs> I couldn't get to go anywhere. It's straight into the wind. It's a tough cast. How do you play the bass like you play? That's very true. The snot flowing, the copious flow of mucus. Um, but it's pretty incredible to, to bang fish after fish after fish after fish. The brookie. I saw him hit it. And get to the point with the with the with the big brooks where you're going, ah, it's just another brook. And and yet it's the biggest trout I've probably caught consistently anywhere in my fly fishing experience. Hey, that's at least uh, 14, 15 pounds. So it's pretty good when you go to a place where you, you actually get tired of catching them. But then again, I didn't get a char, so that's the, that was the ultimate, that was the, that was the holy grail of fish. This might be a char. Nice fish. It's a char. and um, I've yet to get one. Looks like a char to me. It looks like a char to me, too. Five years from now, what do I want to be doing? It's amazing you're still hungry when they come in like that when they're silver, you know it? After being out in the bay. Uh, I want to be fishing. How far is the bay away from here? We're about, uh, I'd say, uh, 40 miles. I want to be, I want to be catching. <laughs> You know what, Joe? I'm going to try to get him landed over here. You want to tail him? Sure. Oh, man. Beautiful in the sunlight, huh? God, is Gorgeous it, fish. Gorgeous fish. That's a beauty. I want to be taking my kids up here. 
watching them catch some fish. Quebec, the name of the game. To receive our brochure, call 1-877-BONJOUR. Hi, this here is Review TV. had a lot of different types of vegetation. We had cattails, arrowheads, Kissimmee grass, gator grass, uh, shoot, I don't know, I'm leaving out a couple of eelgrass. It was a neat lake though, it was shallow. You know, it had some canals. The canals was the deepest water we had in the whole lake. You know, the, the main lake there was, I never saw the water deeper than five foot, but uh, it was a neat lake and uh, I felt really comfortable there. It had dark water, um, I was able to, you know, get in tight and flip like I like to flip and uh, it was a neat lake. You know, on natural lakes, the water level doesn't fluctuate. So what that means to a bass is they can get ultra shallow. They can go, you know, a mile on a three foot flat and it's not going to bother them because, you know, they, they don't have to ever, ever have to worry about the water being dropped or sucked out underneath them by a dam or, you know, generation. You know, that's a big difference between natural lakes and man-made is, is they'll get a lot shallower and they'll stay shallow in, in, a, man, in, a, in a natural lake versus a man-made lake. Nice one. Came out and ate that spinner bait. Right on that trailer hook too, look at that. What I'm doing here is I'm covering a tremendous amount of water with this spinner bait and trying to locate these fish. That's what I kind of try to do when I'm on a natural lake is, you know, I, I, I tend to think that these fish will group up and we're, we're gonna find out now that I've caught one. Um, I'm, I'm gonna throw a spinner bait a little bit more and, then maybe slow down and start flipping a worm and, and see if we can locate them. But you know, what I like to do, what I'm trying to tell you is, is to cover a, a tremendous amount of water. You can fish pretty fast because a lot of times in natural lakes, you won't fish over them. You know, you can get a couple of bites in the area and then go back in that area with a worm or a slower presentation and catch quite a few fish. You know, a lot of times when I'm eliminating water, especially on natural lakes or, or, or you know, lakes of, of the type that I was fishing today, I want to cover a lot of water. I, you know, I chose a spinner bait and I chose to cover a bunch of water because I, I believe, you know, Edwin theory that, you know, you can, you can be going down through there and you can get a bite or two and then you can turn around and, and you found them. You know, I don't think you're going to always fish over them. I think, you know, if you, you can throw a, a moving bait a lot of times, it may not be the bait you need to be throwing, but if the, the fish will show themselves, I guess is what I'm trying to get across. So, you know, I chose to fish that spinner bait and go through there pretty quick and then Boom, I had a couple bites, I was able to turn around, and a lot of times you're able to start catching them flipping or something along those lines. You know, you can slow down, slow your presentation down, and really pick them apart. Oh my goodness. Oh yes. Right there next to them arrowheads. There we go. Good one. Oh. All right. Man, the wind kicked up. And there's another great way to catch them on natural lakes with some spinner bait. You know, get out there and start fishing the, the most wind you can find. Now that fish came, we got a, a, a real sparse cattails right here. And then there was just one clump of arrowheads or, or mother-in-law tongues, whatever you want to call it, but one clump. And that fish came right out of that one clump. So always pay attention to where your bites come from. Where I caught these fish today on a spinner bait, it was it was key that I had little clumps of arrowheads or mother-in-law tongues, whatever you want to call them, you know, mixed in with everything else. You know, we had it all in there mixed in, and and I was really keying in on those arrowheads. I believe those fish were in there, you know, getting ready to spawn or or maybe already spawning. So the key there was, you know, finding those little isolated clumps of arrowheads. And I believe those arrowheads they they grow on the hardest bottom in the in the area. And that's a, that's a big key when you're fishing natural lakes is to, to key in on what the fish are relating to, and that's something you always want to always want to keep in mind is where you had that bite and, and try to duplicate that the rest of the day. 
Oh, yeah! Oh, God. Oh, that was a big one. Oh, man. Okay. You know, today when we started fishing, you know, we were able to catch a few on a spinnerbait, and the wind really started blowing, and we was able to still catch a few, and then it, you know, on a shallow lake like that, the wind really affects it. It, it stirred up the bottom, and it, you know, when you're dealing only with a few feet of water, and the wind and waves start crashing, it really had a lot of stuff in the water. You know, wind's great on a lot of lakes, but when you get in a shallow, natural lake like that, it's, it can be a bad thing, so it, and it really darkened the water, it muddied it up, and that's when I had to adjust and move to those canals. You know, I think canals offer bass in the springtime, you know, warmth, one thing, it's, it's more protected, you know, and to go along with the warmth is the depth, you know, that, that's a reason, you know, canals usually are deeper, uh, they don't, they don't have the current that, like the main lake, you know, from the wind and that kind of stuff, and they usually have harder bottoms, you know, as far as for fish to spawn, they have a lot harder bottoms. When you're in a canal, you know, a lot of times, you know, those are man-made and they have really steep sides. And in the canal that I fished, you know, it had a lot of vegetation out and, and it seemed like, you know, immediately I figured out that, you know, I had little holes in that vegetation where actually I was flipping closer to the bank and it that's where I think those fish were spawning. So. You've got to you've got to determine in those canals. You know you got to think about the steep sides and, and the reasons why the fish were relating to where they were. Uh, for me today, it was just all those holes going down the sides. You know I could picture a fish could spawn right there. They could get up close enough to the bank to be in a shallow enough depth to spawn. Prime example. Oh. Oh man, see that right there? That's a hole. You know, I was looking, I was sitting here mentally trying to picture where a fish would bed, and I flipped it in there, and I let it sit, and I was shaking it, and I was shaking it, and I was shaking it, and I'm thinking, well, it's about time to take it out. And about time I thought that, that started swimming off, and I was like, golly, that could have been perfect, because I almost called that, you know? I, I said, you yeah, that's, know, it's a hole, it's, that's right where they're supposed to be. Another thing, if you're straightening your hook out, don't be stubborn and not retie and put a new hook on. Because if you be stubborn and you don't retie, you're gonna lose them like I just did. Man, that makes me sick. You know, canals, today I caught a lot of these fish out of canals and, and what happened, the wind really started blowing and, it, and, it, and it, I was able to fish like I wanted to in canals. And that's one of the great things about canals, it protects you from the wind. The water's gonna stay a much more stable level in a canal because it's protected from the wind and it's usually deeper in canals so you know canals is something that you need to really focus in on a lot of times especially early in the year. Right here's a prime example of one of those indentions. You can see the fry right there. It, you know that's where they're spawning. You know we have an indention we're able to get closer to the bank getting sunlight. You know that's what that's what I'm keying on is these little indentions. You have one right here one up just a little bit further and that's those bites that I've been having, that's where they've been coming from. Oh, oh there she is. <laughs> Boys, that's a <laughs> Oh, I left that bait in there a long time. I was about to take it out and she ate it. That goes to show patience. You gotta be patient. <laughs> Man, that's a good one too. That is a good one. Mr. Marty, I think I might have got one as big as yours. Oh, come here. Come here. Man, that's a toad. Oh, son. Look at that fish right there. Healthy, healthy, healthy. Guys, it, I just, I, I, I guarantee you that bait had been in there 30 to 45 seconds. And I, if you watch, I was just fixing to take Take it out, and it went thump. Goes to show for patience. Man, that's a good fish. I like that. That's a good one. See you, girl. All right. I like that. That's just, it doesn't get any better. I just hooked myself. I'm so excited. I mean, I just, I 
sitting there and it's sitting there and I about, yeah, I put, about to take it out and I was like, uh-oh, I better set the hook. I mean, that was a fish. I like that. Gets me excited. That's a six pounder, maybe close to seven. I'm not gonna be like Marty and call it an eight or a nine. You know, if Marty had caught that fish, it'd been eight or a nine. You know, where that fish came from is, you know, something pretty important. You look down this canal, and there's one little set of reeds, you know, a set of reeds in the water, it's something different. And that, you know, that goes fishing anywhere, natural lakes, you know, man-made lakes. You know, I always try to key on something just a little bit different going down the canal or lakes, you know, like the indentions like we've talked about earlier or, or one lone set of cattails. That's right where that fish came from is one, one lone set of cattails. So just pay attention to what you have and, and key in on, on, on things that are different, you know. Today, you know, I, I got in an area and I, you know, I, I felt like, you know, this area is going to have them because it had all those types of vegetation. I, I wanted to find something today that was diverse. I wanted to find, you know, a little cattail clump here, some arrowheads or mother-in-law tongues, whatever you want to call them right here, and some Kissimmee grass. And, you know, I wanted it all mixed in together. And I found an area like that and I, I was able to catch a few fish on the spinner bait. Then the wind really started blowing. So, you know, I had to adjust again and I had to move into those canals and, and you know, it, it, you gotta, you gotta eliminate water, but you know, also gotta take in, into consideration the wind and, and you know, the forces of mother nature. And uh, I was able to get in those canals and I was able to get in there tight and flip and, and I felt pretty good about it. Oh, there we go. Yeah, boy. That's a good one too, boys. Shit. There's a fish. <laughs> we just moved. We moved off the main lake into a canal, and that's my second flip right there. Whoo, that was fun. I liked it. That gets me excited. Good fish. Good fish. Yesterday we had a kind of a front come through, so I've been out fishing, you know, the shallower water, and I came in here, and this water's seven, eight foot deep, and I'm thinking maybe, you know, this is gonna retain its temperature a little better than say those shallow flats where we just came from so it's looking good so far i got goosebumps i mean i got goosebumps on my legs and i like that oh look at there there's a bass you see that bass just jumped right out in front of my trolling motor let's catch another one he tore that worm up man i'm excited i don't you know i guess if i ever quit getting excited about fishing it's time to quit You know, in springtime, bottom composition is huge. I mean, I use my rod as my depth finder a lot of times, but most of the time I'm, I'm using it to check the bottom, to see if it's hard, if it's mucky, what it's made of. And that's really huge, you know, natural lakes or man-made, any one of them. But it's, it's important because, you know, a fish needs a hard bottom to spawn. And, you know, that, that's going to tell you if you're in an area where you think a lot of fish could be or, you know, moving in or spawning. So it's really important in natural lakes, you know, and, and then the temperature goes right along with that, you know. You know, sometimes a softer bottom may hold heat, but, you know, a lot of times that harder bottom is where they're going to be going to. So I, I think it's really important to have, you know, a hard bottom and, and to be able to always, you know, poke your rod over the side and, and see what the bottom's made of. Something else that will really help you springtime fishing is if you ever go sight fishing you can learn so much about how a fish will bed when you come to an area where you can't see them. I cannot see them here but I feel like there's fish on this and what you want to do is picture those areas that you saw when you were sight fishing in clear water you can picture those same areas it's not necessarily you flipping the thickest cover you might flip in a hole or you might flip between bushes or something like that. You know, one of my best tournaments ever, I was flipping buck brush, but I wasn't flipping the buck brush. I was flipping in between them. The holes, you know, right, right. If I had to, I wanted to be in the middle. You didn't want to hit the bases. You wanted to be right in the middle. Um, you know, in the springtime, if you ever sight fished, it, it'll help you tremendously when you cannot see them. You know, an example that really you know, a light bulb going off in my head. I had a tournament at Toledo Bend one time, 
and I had a bush here and a bush here, and you know, most of us, we're gonna flip on this bush, we're gonna flip on this bush. Well, I was flipping right in the middle, and what it was was those fish had a bed, you know, right between two bushes. So it's important to, to, to in the spring, you know, maybe not necessarily hit right on the bush or, or, or right in the thickest stuff. You know, try to picture where you think that fish may be bedding. Oh, right there's a prime example of it. That's a little one, though. That's a minnow, but I got him. A lot of times, you know, it's important that, you know, again, we're talking about springtime fishing. I'm gonna throw right back in there because that could just be the male. And, and a lot of times, you know, I, again, I wanna stress, I'm not seeing these fish, but I believe that they're on this. And, you know, I'm gonna throw right back in there, right where that fish came from, and I'm gonna see if I can catch a bigger fish. You know, it may not happen this time or the next time or the next 10 times, but it will happen to you. You'll catch that female. Time, you know, another one of those fish that I, that I lost. You know, I threw it in there and I was sitting there shaking it. You know, I, I pictured a bed there. So my presentation today was really important in the fact that I was trying to picture beds and I was trying to fish slow. You know, if you've ever sight fished and you've thrown in there on a bed, that fish swims off and then it comes back. Well, most people are gonna take that bait out and the fish has never even came back to the bed. So, you know, think about that when you're out there fishing, to throw in there, you know, picture that fish swimming out here, around here, and you know, over here, and then you move it a little bit, and then you get his attention. So try to picture that's what I'm trying to say, is that, you know, those fish are on beds, you can't really see them, but you're fishing at a slow enough presentation that it, you allow enough time for that fish to get there and get comfortable, and then you'll catch him. Another hole. I mean, just another hole right back in there. Kind of harder to see, because it's got some, you know, some a float, a floating mat in there. You know, on a mat, something else that's really important in natural lakes. I mean, they hold heat. Um, a fish feels really protected. You know, a lot of natural lakes are shallow. So they got birds that are, you know, on the shoreline. And, you know, I've caught a lot of bass in natural lakes that ha actually have gouges in them where a bird's, you know, mistaking them for a smaller fish. And, you know, a mat will protect the, protect the bass a lot of times. And it's just, it's a, it's a, it's a thing you want to look for on natural lakes is a mat a lot of times. You know, for me, when I'm flipping really heavy cover, I like braided line and, and, a, and a heavy hook and, and a tungsten weight. And you know, I like braid because, you know, I don't, I don't have to worry about retying it th through the day. But the main reason is I can have a, a, a pretty sorry hook set and I'm still gonna drill that fish right in the roof of the mouth. You know, you may be sitting there working that worm and you may be up here, say, 11, 12 o'clock and get a bite you're still able to, to jerk right here because braid has no stretch. So that's the, the reasons or the advantages I like in braid. It doesn't have any of the stretch and you know, I don't have, ever have to worry about it breaking off. You know, something that you really need to, 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 to think about or to you know, have in the, in the back of your brain is, is you know, if you had a cold front come through you know, and you have, you have mats in natural lakes and, and what that does for a bass is it, it, it holds heat, you know, that sun shining on that dark mat and it's really radiating heat underneath there. So you need to be prepared with an ounce, ounce and a half weight to punch those mats. You know, today I didn't catch any fish doing that, but it's something you need to be thinking about. It's something that really works a lot of times in natural lakes. Oh, oh, that was a big one. Oh, man. Okay. Right next to the arrow here. Oh, Golly, I cannot believe this. Humbling sport, the most humbling sport in the world. I promise you. You know, today I was I was really excited about you know catching some big fish on a spinner bait, and you know I had a couple bites on it, and I had a couple that really you know ate my lunch. They got away, 
But, uh, you know, I was able to salvage the day. I was able to move into a canal and start flipping and something I really like to do and able to catch one really good fish and a couple other fish. And, uh, you know, it, it, overall it was a pretty good day, but uh, I sure would like to have caught a couple of those big fish there at the end. But, you know, I'll take it. Any day you can catch, you know, a couple good fish, you know, it's a whole lot better than sitting on the couch. As simple as a canal looks, there still was certain things that Edwin would key in on that made for a successful pattern, whether it was a combination of vegetation or a certain depth of water. And that's important because when you go to expand on that pattern, you know exactly what to look for, what will make for a successful canal, one that you don't even need to waste your time in. That's very important. Remember that when you're faced with that same type of scenario. Join us next week on Classic Patterns. Classic Patterns is brought to you by the Classic Patterns Collector's Edition DVD series, Unlock the Secrets of the Pros, and Sport Brims, always there but never in the way. Everybody. Welcome to the show. Our first story is about pheasant hunting passion. Passion by three pheasant hunters who moved to South Dakota almost lock, stock, and barrel. Once upon a time in the small country town of Parkston, South Dakota, there was a house on Main Street that nobody wanted. Then one day, three pheasant hunters from Minnesota wandered into town to meet an old friend. Patty comes along and she says, well, I think you can get a house for three. Three? 30,000? No, I, I don't think so. She said, no, 3,000. I said, what? You get the three-story house with four bedrooms, uh, wooden floors, cut glass windows, full kitchen. I thought we were absolutely crazy. Because why would we need a house when we can stay in the motel up the street for $20 a night? Well, Patty comes whipping in the door, big smile on her face. You got it. Oh, we were the only bidders. <laughs> so begins a story about the boys on Main Street, Skip Hall, Butch Hawkins, and Jerry Brower. It's a story about big city boys living with small town folks. All because of South Dakota's famous game bird, which binds them all together. Well, hi, neighbors. Hey, good neighbors. You don't know they're around. Oh, when pheasant season rolls around in October, the house on Main Street starts a jumping. Guests arrive. Hunting dogs bunk where they want. It's kind of an open door policy, and uh, we have enough space. If, uh, if it gets overcrowded, we roll sleeping bags out on the floor. There's the syrup. However you make it is <laughs> the way we like it. Eating has never been a problem here. <laughs> Everybody else cooks, so I get to do the dishes. That's fine with me. It's absolutely effortless. It's just nothing. We all enjoy the same things, and there's no issues. There's no... There's nothing. I mean, I went to school with Butch and uh, ran track against Skip. We maintain a, a sense of humor. <laughs> We're, I guess, we know each other so well that, uh, number one, you you know which area is not, which button's not to push. Their days are spent rousting ringnecks. Ten! And it's a passion they share with their dogs. Come on, Trigger. Come on, bud. You ready? There's a rooster right there. That away! Yeah. Nice shot, Ron. Hit the bird. Yeah. Boy, it didn't take him long to get the bird. Holy buckets. Good retrieve there. I've been coming out since I was seven years old. We shot our, my first pheasant at eight yeah. with a 410 double barrel like so many. Hit the bird. South Dakota, well, 47 years ago when I was 12. So I think I missed one year and I missed two openings. One, I had pneumonia, so and the other one, my daughter was born. Well, it's the guys. It's it's the guys, and it's the the hunting is fun, and uh, but we're everybody's got dogs, and uh, as you know, with your dogs, it's that's the fun part about it. Her. Watching them work the fields and the dogs. Out in the country, there isn't a farmer they don't know. Yet pheasant hunting never comes with guarantee. Hey, what happened there? There. The Wiley Ringneck, they're named that for a reason, because we haven't figured it out yet, and I don't think we ever will. 
But there's another side to living in Parkston. You gotta have it. Once you know everybody in town, it's uh, it's just like putting on an old glove. How's it going? You realize that this is this is middle America. I mean, these, these are nice, nice people, and uh, they're kind, they're genuine. There's no pretension at all out here, and that's what's fun. <laughs> We have uh, friends here, and uh, when either their children have weddings or they're getting married for the umpteenth time or whatever the case may be, uh, uh, we would come out here, as, as I say, just for as we would anybody else. So that's the way it is for eight long weekends every autumn. Minnesota boys on Main Street in a South Dakota town. No rules. No. Just have fun. <laughs> in Parkston, population, three more. Up next, Browning's Top Gun talks shotgun shows. So many choices, which are the best for your next hunt? A few simple farming practices can make all the difference when it comes to habitat. We're headed to North Dakota to check out a few habitat tips. First aid in the field can make or break your hunt. What should you keep in your kit? All that. Plus, we'll have the story of one young artist. Pheasants Forever Television, brought to you by Game. The Complete Pheasant Hunter, a member of Pheasants Forever and dressed by Brownie. Brownie's Pheasants Forever Upland Series offers a complete line of clothing for the field. Vests, jackets, pants, each designed with innovative features for the complete bird hunter. Ton up in here. And did you know, with every purchase, Brownie makes a contribution to preserve ringneck habitat. Where Brownie help a ringneck. Now we head to the field for Shotgun Savvy. Brought to you by Browning. The best there is. Hi, I'm Ed Preckle with Browning and Top Gun Shooting Sports. Today we're going to take a look at choke and the important role that it plays in your shooting performance. What is the choke? The choke is located in the last couple inches of the shotgun barrel and it determines the effective range of the shotgun. Rooster! Early in the pheasant season, it's important to have an open pattern. A lot of the shots tend to be 20 yards or less and it's key to get a, the most effective pattern possible. Again, we talked about the early season. The Browning guns come with three different chokes, an improved cylinder for early season, out to about 20 yards, then the modified later in the season, out to 40 yards, and improved modified or full for 50 yards and beyond. So remember, early in the season, we want to pick an improved cylinder choke and open up that pattern for the close shots, and as the season rolls on and the shots get longer, we'll move to a modified and maybe a full choke. Remember, pick the right choke and make your time of field the best there is. Up next, a personal story of sorts. It's about a friend of mine named John Larson. For years, John and I dreamed of having our own pheasant hunting spot in North Dakota. Then, guess what? It happened. A North Dakota prairie. In North Dakota, the moon rises over cattails, not skyscrapers. And when the sun goes down, it dips behind a horizon of grasslands and wetlands. But when autumn comes, I'm up here. it's ringneck hunting time, and this is a birdie place. And good dog, good dog. See all those birds flying out? God, they're jumping out ahead of us. There goes some more. Pheasants in the air is exactly the farm crop John Larson and his hunting partners were hoping to find. You see, it's a farm crop they planted in a way. Come on, Maggie. Good girl. Good girl. Not by releasing birds, but by creating birdie habitat. I've uh, been putting in small food plots wherever I can find some level ground in the old pasture land. Because of the ag land, that went into CRP, and we're only allowed to put 5% of that into food plots once they're done. But then I've plowed up the old pasture land, and I'm planting uh, various uh, kinds of small grain and corn and sorghum in the food plot. In other words, it's a do-it-yourself pheasant management project. John and partners purchased the old farm land a few years ago. When we first looked at it, uh, this whole area where we're sitting was all pasture or hay land, and it was uh, hayed every year, and the rest of the land was ag land and harvested every year. 
so it was pretty barren. As a boy who grew up on a farm and loved pheasant hunting, John knew what needed to happen. The first thing we did was uh, get rid of the cattle, and then we uh, talked to a couple local farmers that uh, would plant crops that would be favorable to the pheasants. All that oats, those birds are going to be eating that all winter. Besides food plots, some land was enrolled in federal conservation reserve programs to make nesting habitat. No bird. And more habitat ideas flew. Here's a dugout that we, uh, game and fish dugout for us to uh, provide water for the wildlife. Other species of wildlife also have responded to the habitat changes, but it's the ringnecks that seem to be booming. Dang. Last year, I estimate we took about 200 roosters off of here. This year, uh, about halfway through the season, we're nearing 100. I know the birds are still here, but it's uh, harder to find them because they're more spread out. One rooster in that whole draw, man. The message isn't new, but the lesson remains. The right habitat can work on any farm by any farmer. It's real easy for anybody to do, and the investment is mainly in the land. For the CRP, there's a cost share program on that. And then we also planted 18,000 trees, and that's a cost share program, too. So when the rain nicks fly over this part of North Dakota, it's no accident. And I probably have more fun playing farmer than I do hunting. It's uh, fun to see the changes that can take place in the land, and in the three years that we've been here, the land has made a dramatic change. A crop of ringnecks yeah. is special in another way. It's a crop with feathers no no that bird. doesn't wait to be picked like a row of corn. The harvest, well, it's earned. Look what I got, boys. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> hard earned, hard earned. <laughs> Straight ahead, we're off to the kitchen. Chef John whips up a one-of-a-kind pheasant recipe. And later, an Ohio artist makes his mark in the world of wildlife. Pheasants Forever Television, brought to you by Browning, the best there is. And by EAR Inc., specialized hearing systems for sportsmen and hunters. It's time for today's Ringneck Pointer. Hey, Chef John, looks uh, sort of bright and cheery in here today. Yeah, you know, those are actually red peppers. I'm going to call that pheasant in a red sea bag. Pheasant in a red sea bag. Well, that's kind of clever. Well, I was an old submarine sailor, so you know, I got to get back to basics. So this what is do we a have here? pheasant breast that I've flattened. It's skinned. Yeah. And the reason I flatten is I want to get it a little more surface area, and it's nice and even, so it bakes even. I'm going to take some Cajun seasoning. This could be any season you want, but I like to give it a little bit of zing, so this is some Cajun All seasoning. Right. A piece of ham. Okay. Uh, some cheese. Now, this is provolone. You could use any cheese that you want. All right. We'll just take it like that. Then what happens? Now, I'm going to take a nice fresh pepper and okay. make sure it's nice and firm and fresh. I'm just going to cut the ends out. Don't don't worry about the seeds. Seeds are actually pretty good to eat in a pepper. Uh, they really? make a little bit of crunch, so if you don't get the seeds out, don't worry about it. Okay. And then right. all we're going to do is roll this guy up here. What you can do for me is put some green pepper, some red onion, some carrots in the bottom. Just throw it all in the Just bottom of the pot. Just put it right in yeah. here? Because we're going to use that uh, when we're done for part of all our right. filling. There goes the onions. Yeah. And the carrots here go and in. And then I'm just stuffing my pepper with the breast. Just okay. putting it in there. And I'm not really actually being very tender about this. I want to make sure it gets in there. Okay, super. Look at there. Here's a, some more uh -huh. that you've done earlier. All righty. Okay, here we now go. Now I'm going to put some chicken stock in there. That'll keep it nice, nice and moist. We're going to pour it over the, over the breast so that we get some of it inside. All right. Then I got a little extra cheese left over. Oh yeah, yeah. that's always good. Okay. Extra cheese. There we go. Put the cover on All and right. we'll put that down in there. Now what happens? We're going to bake this in a 375 oven for about an hour. Hot, 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 hot. Whoa, hot, whoa. Hey. Let me shut my oven quick. Yeah. Look at now, that. Look at how nice it is. Now watch out for the steam. It'll burn your nose. Look at Ooh, that. Wow. Oh, wow. Now, okay. look at now. These are still a little... Look at there. Now we baked them. We got not, a lot of nice moisture. That's going to roll over. Mm -hmm. Then we got the cheese. Oh. Okay. Now I'm telling you, that is a great way to do pheasant breast. It keeps it moist. It introduces some nice flavor. Mmm. Mm, good eating. Purina presents Gun Dog Savvy. Purina. Fuel the champion within. Harley, I'd like to have you help me with some tips for our viewers. For example, if we're finished hunting in a field or we're going to quit hunting for the day, what we should look for at our dog or should we check them over? 
Sure, Bob. I think the most important thing is to go over every inch of the dog and look for small problems that may have occurred while he was hunting so we can prevent them from becoming large problems later on. Specifically, I like to start with the nose, look for plant material or cuts, go around the edges of the lips like this, look at the corners of the eyes and open the eyelids to make sure that no foreign material has gotten in there. And run along the edge of the ears, feel every inch of them, look down in the ear canals, and just run my hands over the entire body, down each leg, and um, in between the toes, just to make sure that we haven't gotten a cut or a puncture or something that, because the dog is working so hard, he's not going to show you right away, but can become a serious problem later. So, Arlie, those are key things to look for, but what about a first aid kit? What, what should we have there? I like to carry a few things with me in the field to take care of these minor injuries. Some antiseptic to clean the wounds and some wound dressing to keep the wound covered and keep it from becoming infected. Some bandage material. I like to have a cold pack in case the dog suffers an orthopedic injury so we can get ice on it right away. I like to have a pair of forceps that I can use to get plant material out of the dog if it's stuck in the skin someplace or if we run into a porcupine to help remove quills. I always carry a thermometer to make sure the dog hasn't overheated and to know where he is in case he seems warm. And I always carry a Prina Pro Plan Performance Bar with me. It's a readily available source of carbohydrates that I can use to treat my dog if he gets hypoglycemic. Thanks, Arlie. Those are great tips, folks. If we're able to identify small abrasions and things we can treat ourselves, but better yet, if there's a, a more serious problem, we'll identify that and seek proper vet care. Still ahead. We travel to Ohio to meet one of Pheasants Forever's youngest and most promising artists. Pheasants Forever Television, brought to you by Purina, Fuel the Champion Within, and by Safari Club International. I'm also a member of Pheasants Forever. I've seen firsthand that Pheasants Forever makes a difference for wildlife. Pheasants have taken hold right here where I live. I'm also a Pheasants Forever volunteer. All the money that's raised stays in your community. To join or volunteer, call toll-free or check us out online. It's all about the habitat, and Pheasants Forever is all about habitat. Join Pheasants Forever and make a difference for wildlife. Up next, our man afield, Bill Shirk, offers up a story about a young artist who's making quite a name for himself with Pheasants Forever, not with a shotgun, but with his paintbrush. Good girl, come. Heal up. Some folks see the world differently. Adam Brim's view starts with a snapshot. Dakota. Good girl, heal up. Love it, love it. Each time the camera clicks, Adam paints a picture. But I always found that the things that man has made, I never felt as passionate about compared to the things that God has made. Good girl, huh? Good girl. Ow. Adam got his start in the outdoor world as a young hunter and fisherman. My dad has always been out hunting, and he started taking me hunting with him, you know, when I was old enough to keep up. And he taught me to respect and appreciate everything in nature. I've been taking him hunting since he was old enough to drag along. And he just, uh, he just always loved, he's always loved nature. I really have to credit most of my passion to him. That passion led to a life documenting the natural world. You see, what starts on film ends with acrylic, oil, and canvas. Adam paints. Five days a week, usually seven or eight hours a day. Generally, a painting about this size take, takes me about a month to do. The bird itself is really detailed. This full-time artist has reason to be proud. At 26 years old, Adam happens to be one of Ohio's most highly regarded conservationists. I was selected as the man of the year, which was kind of a neat, a neat award to get. Started drawing when I was about three. Started painting when I was, well, probably the first time was when I was about eight or nine. Adam's work sold at flea markets long before he could even drive a car. I've just always had this desire to try to put stuff down that I see on paper. When he started painting wildlife, Adam set a goal. 
He always loved ducks. He thought someday he might be good enough to win the federal duck stamp, wildlife art's highest honor. When Adam turned 21, he sent in this picture. And yep, you guessed it, Adam won. Winning it when I did, that was, it was kind of like, well, gosh, now where do I go? Because that's the biggest contest out there. So that was a, such a huge honor to win that. He used the award as a springboard to paint and raise money for Habitat. Habitat for Ohio's pheasants and ducks. I just want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart um, for everything from everybody. The state named two wildlife areas in Adam's name, the same areas he helped protect. Well, to know that I had a part in that, you know, that's, that's what really, um, you know, makes it for me. Even now, Adam continues to donate prints to Pheasants Forever and other conservation groups. You know, they're what's helping to preserve and create this world that I find so incredible. A world he hopes to capture, one brush stroke at a time. One of the main things I love to try to do is to get people to look at the natural world that's around all of us a little closer. Okay, come on. Because I think if people do, it'll only help to promote conservation of the things that we love. My, my, what talent's out there in the land of ringnecks. That about does it for us. Remember, take a kid hunting. I'm Ron Shera with my hunting buddy, Raven. Yeah, that's a good girl. forever. That truly is our goal. Join us. 10 new cars and trucks in 20 months. An American revolution. Yum! Soft plastic lures. Start a feeding frenzy. Fast Pro Shops. World's leading supplier of premium outdoor gear. And Mercury, number one on the water. No, I've gone fishing with Bill Dance today. Closed captioning for today's show provided by Low Rents. We lead, we find, you win. It's been a favorite and often quoted saying among fishermen that the good Lord doesn't deduct from a man's time on earth the hours he spends fishing. And since there's seven times more water than land, <laughs> man should be allowed to fish seven times more than he works. Whoop. Hey, good morning. Down there in that grass, wasn't he, buddy? He's now. Woo! There we go. Okay, what was I saying? <laughs> oh, yeah, man should fish seven times more than he works. Now, you know, that saying's probably older than baseball, but somebody believed it. Apparently, a bunch of somebodies, because today there's over 70 million folks doing it. The thought underlying this theory is that fishing so soothes the soul and relaxes the mind as to vastly increase one's chances for longevity. <laughs> Let me tell you something, I sure hope that part about longevity is true, because I, for one, hope to do this forever, and then maybe even a little bit more. Coming up, going down, coming up, there he comes. 
<coughs> Strong, buddy. through. A nice one too. A nice one. Ooh, big old round bend hook. That, oh, look at here. Isn't that pretty? Yep. See ya. Fish has been deep, it looks like. Pretty light colored. <laughs> All righty. Let me tell you what we're going to be doing today. Now, the majority of the bass in this area are in a depth of about three to six feet. At this depth, there's quite a bit of vegetation extending from about a foot up to three, three and a half, maybe four feet off of the bottom. Now, we're fishing a spinnerbait here, and what we're doing, we're just slow rolling it in, through, and over this submerged grass. What we've got is a high spot out here. It's kind of a big flat. Comes off of a point, extends out, it's got a little drop, and it comes back up to a depth of about 10 feet. Kind of a big flat area right out in here and the vegetation's all over it. Vegetation's coming up off of the bottom, like I said, anywhere from, oh, I'm gonna say a foot to two and a half, three, four, maybe four feet up off of the bottom. Up higher on the spot, the vegetation comes up a little bit higher. But all we're doing, we're doing it extremely simple. Just a simple cast, let it fall just a bit, jerk it to get the blade going and just kind of slow rolling it. And we feel that vegetation, we just kind of jerk it just a little bit. But just a slow, steady retrieve. Bill Dance Outdoors. That's going to knock the fire out of it. Got it again. <coughs> Good in there. I don't know if that was the same fish or not. Oh, yeah. Oh, I kind of looked like old Roland Martin then, didn't I? Oh, look here. Come on back here, get out of that trolling hole. Oh, isn't that a pretty one? Come here. You want that thing out of your face, don't you? All right, come here. Easy. Look at that party, baby. Get your pretty thing, you. I said I look like Roland Martin. <laughs> Roland Martin, I never caught a fish as big. Claims he has. But you know how Roland lies. See you, buddy. The particular spinnerbait we've selected to use is ideal for this situation. It's a 3 8 ounce booyah that has a sculptured head with incredible detail. It also sports a 50 strand bioflex skirt and a super sharp round bend hook, plus nickel plated willow blades that produce tremendous flash. For years, spinnerbaits were generally regarded as shallow water lures fished in a foot to two feet of water. But today, more and more fishermen are discovering they're also great for fishing in deeper water. For use in deeper depths, the willow blade models are the most popular. They have less water resistance than rounded blades, therefore, they're easier to work down a little deeper. They don't have the tendency to ride up on the retrieve like blades that have more resistance. Willow blades spin faster and emit more flash than the Colorado or Indiana models. Where we go? Come out of that grass, boy. Here he comes, here he comes up. There he goes back down. <laughs> Whoa. That's a strong fish right there, my boy. That's a strong fish right there, my boy. Come here. Easy. Whoa. Big fat fish coming out of that black water. 
Look how gold that water fish looks right there underwater. It just turns gold. So. <laughs> okay, another tip when fishing a spinnerbait in deeper depths is to use a fine diameter line. Now, my choice today for fishing this type of situation is Strand's 14 pound test Magnaflex, which has an outside diameter equivalent to that of about 12 pound test. It's plenty thin to let the lure get down quickly, yet it's strong enough for plowing through heavy cover and ideal for getting a good hook set go. due to a low stretch factor. Here we go, here he comes, here he comes, here he comes. Smoking it. Look at him, throw it ahead. Hey, man. What do you say there? He looks so gold down in that black water. They're really light colored, though. You throw that water on me. You throw that water on me. You throw that water on me. Where am I? There it is. Golden colored. Big time golden colored. And that water has really turned. Today's Fishing Journal with news and tips from around the country is brought to you by Progressive. All boat insurance is not the same, so be sure to shop around like I did. Young artists take notice. The conservation group Wildlife Forever sponsors annual art contests for U.S. students in grades 4 through 12. Artists must submit a painting or drawing of their own state's official fish. Teachers use the contest to teach lessons about the importance of conserving aquatic resources and local species to students across America. Winners from each state are honored in each category. Interested? Contact Wildlife Forever for full information. Today's Conditions Log is brought to you by Plano Tackle Systems and the new 3614 and 3714 spinnerbait systems. Featuring individual compartments and easy flip-up access, they're perfect for spinnerbaits, jigs, and even lipless crankbaits. All from America's favorite tackle boxes, Plano. show is brought to you in part by Strin. Make the switch to Strin, the most dependable fishing line in the world. And Let me tell you something else. Whatever type of submerged cover or structure that you're fishing, there are three basic retrieves that are going to help you. One is to position your boat deep and cast into the shallower water and then retrieve downhill. Now remember, when doing this, a very slow retrieve will allow the lure to swim in a downward arch. Another good retrieve is a parallel retrieve. This is where your boat is positioned over the edge and your caster made parallel to it, letting the bait sink to the proper depth and then retrieving it. Finally, the third option is to position your boat shallow and cast out deep. This allows the spinnerbait to gradually climb uphill. Now the uphill retrieve allows you to stay in contact with your lure at all times. Something else it does, it allows your lure to stay closer to the cover than the downhill retreat. And let me tell you, that's especially productive when bass are holding tight. But let me warn you, this particular presentation can cost you fish if the cover's thick. In this position, what you're doing, you're pulling your catch into the shallower cover. Where are you going, buddy? Where are you going? Look at that fish go. Good night. There he comes. Wow. <laughs> Pulling. Come here with yourself. Now ease up there. Boy. You got that bait in there. Ah. 
Hello. How we doing? Got fools. You thought that was a big old shed minna, didn't you? <laughs> a little bit earlier, we mentioned the importance of blades. Now, for this type of fishing that we're doing today, this willow leaf Colorado combination is ideal. Its shape is long and it's thin. It creates minimal lift, very little vibration and water resistance. And it works extremely well on deep, slow retrieves. Something else that's good about a willow bladed lure, it's gonna pick up less weeds than rounded type blades. When working a spinnerbait through clinging, submerged vegetation like we have here, a longer, slimmer willow leaf blade rotates closer to its axis and flops from side to side, generally bouncing off the vegetation. Rounded blades spin around the shaft rather than flop around, and they pick up a lot more weeds around the swivel that connects the blade it's to the wire. Whoa, buddy. Look at the strength of that fish. Well, you talk about a strong buddy right there. Look at that pole. Whoa. Come on around here. Come on around here. Goodness gracious. Great balls of fire. Like Jerry Lee Lewis. Oh, look at this big potted honey right here. Boy. <laughs> Let me get that. Booyah! Out of your face. Look at that. Isn't that gorgeous. Ooh, pretty fish, pretty. There he goes. Bill Dance Outdoors. Slow, steady retrieve is our most productive presentation. Let me tell you something. If there's one thing I've learned, there's simply no shortcuts to success, except to say that you've got to do whatever it takes to catch fish. You've always got to experiment. The same lure, color, size, and presentation won't work every time. Good fishermen have learned from experience that they must be versatile in order to catch bass on a regular basis. Boom! <laughs> Whoa, look here. Look at that pole. Look at that fishing pole, Ben. Oh, that's a strong baby. Oh, look out, your honor, mama. I just don't want to come up to the top, and I'm pulling with all my might. I sound like Bill Cosby, don't I? Uh, let me get back up here. Look how fat that honey bunny is. You done wore yourself out pulling, hadn't you? <laughs> yes, I was, let me tell you something. If I was, if I was, don't you get cute. If I was fat as you were, I couldn't jump either. Come on, I'd be wore out myself if I was as fat as you. Oh, look how fat that baby. I'm gonna pull him up. Look at that big hunky bunk. Talk about a fatten. I'm not a gorgeous fish. Huh? You about got me out of breath, old boy. Look at that. Look at this turned gold underwater. That black water. See ya. Get back on that grass bed. <laughs> Let me tell you. Fishing spinnerbaits deeper than normal demands less physical effort than many other lures and forms of bass fishing. It does require some careful thought, however. Critical boat position, lots of confidence in what you're doing, a bunch of patience, and technique for methodical retrieves. Let me tell you, if you lack any of these, you'll have little success. However, if you have, make it a point to slow your pace, flash the weedy depths. Let me tell you, you better stay on ready because that big bump or boom is often only a cast away. Thanks so much for tuning in, and we'll see you next time right here on OLN. See you.